of people, but it's, it's time to start here. Uh, the tests are graded. However, I've got one student that wasn't here for the test. Uh, I'm going to give an opportunity to at least provide an explanation, and we will see in terms of that. So, uh, uh, and the graded, the grades are there on, on Blackboard. You can see those. Everything we've been doing so far really is kind of laying the groundwork for calculus. We really haven't done any calculus yet. We've been looking at functions and the things we can do with functions. But even if we've been looking at functions, we've spent some time uh, working with different ways of looking at functions. We can look at functions with the table graph, formula, and, and information. And one of the bits of information we've been interested in kind of determining with functions is the relationship between rate and accumulation. <coughs> I mentioned that I think the first day of class we're going to be looking kind of the, uh, the relation of rate and accumulation. We really haven't done that yet that, that we've identified. <coughs> but there is a case we've done it. And, and, and we'll, we'll talk about that more today. And, and hopefully lead into, well, how are we going to approach that with, with other functions? Because there is one function where we can do this fairly readily from the information we're given, be it the accumulation or the rate. We can figure out the other one. But in terms of approaching functions, each approach, I think, can help illuminate the other. Sometimes we'll see more from the formula. Certainly from the formula, we can make predictions accurately. Um, but the, the table is sometimes what we start with. The graph, there's some patterns we can see better. So looking at different facets of the problem can help us understand it. Well, as we get into calculus, there are also multiple ways we can approach calculus. Uh, in an intuitive way. What does a topic really mean? Uh, a practical way. How do we really use this topic? And, and how do we really do these computations? And a theoretical way. Why, why does our approach really work? I'm definitely going to intend to, to stay more in the intuitive and practical. Not really get into why does a topic really work. But what does a topic mean? And how are we applying that topic? And first off, really going back to this idea of rate versus accumulation. What does it really mean? How do we really do that in practice for uh, some specific examples? So the, the theoretical approach would be more in calculus one, or maybe even an advanced calculus class where we kind of come back and look at, well, why does all this work? So we're, we're definitely not going to get into the why does all this work, unless sort of the why and helps us understand what the topic is, is all about. So as we think about accumulation versus rate, um, for, for linear functions, they are, are pretty easy to relate. We, we haven't specifically done that, so, so let's think about that now. So if we, we're given a formula. Our distance traveled from a spot. So, so we, we are starting at some spot, and we're going to start traveling. And, and the spot we're starting from may be different than the spot we're measuring from. So we've got a spot that we're going to measure from, which may or may not be the same as the spot we start from. And we're traveling away at a certain rate. So if we were told, say, the distance equals 50t plus 10, that describes our distance at any time from the spot. So at any time, we're 50t plus 10 away from this spot where we've been asked to measure. Well, if we look at this, can we figure out the rate? How fast are we traveling?
talk a little bit more about that, but, but you did fairly well with the rate. The rate here is 50. When we've talked lines, the slope, we, we've also talked about the rate of change. How much does the output change in relation to the input? That's the idea of the rate. How much distance change over time? So in general, rate is change in distance over change in time, which for this equation is just the slope of the line. And we can read the slope of the line off the equation. So if we're given a linear equation, turns out the rate of change is always constant. That's one of the things that, that makes a line unique. The rate of change is constant, and we can read it right off the equation. We're traveling 50 miles an hour away from our spot. Well, how far away did we start from the spot? This is our formula that tells us how far we are away after a certain time. <coughs> we had started 10 units away. That's also we can read from here. This is our starting position. When time is zero, we were 10 units away. So in this case, we started 10 units away. We're moving away at 50 miles per hour, or whatever the 50 stands for. Do that over time. We can come up with a model that predicts how far away, and how much have we accumulated in terms of distance traveled over time. And the formula works very nice here. We can then, from the formula, make predictions. You know, how far would we be away in you know, three hours? When would we be you know, 210 miles away? There, there are a number of questions we could ask. Once we have the relationship between the rate, which is the slope, and the accumulated distance. So in the case of a line, the connection the rate is our slope of the line. The accumulation is actually the, the y value we get out of the line equation. So, like I kind of said, we, we can answer questions like this. So, how, how far are we going to be away after three hours? So after three hours, we are going to be 160 miles away. We can just put three in the formula. Or even when we've identified the rate here is 50, and we started 10 miles away, if we're going 50 miles per hour, well, in three hours, we'll travel 150 past the 10 we started. That would take us to 160 miles away. And so we can make the connection in the case of linear, the accumulation versus the rate. We could go the other way as well. So suppose we were given a verbal description that tells us how far we start from the spot and how far we're going, to, how fast we're going to travel away. So we're told the rate here, and we're looking to figure out well what, what's our formula for the accumulation, or our distance away. of the line. The 20, what we started with, plus 60t, the slope times t, that's our accumulation. And once we have the formula, again, we can make predictions. How far would we go in three hours, or how, how far would we be away from the spot in three hours? When would we be 320 miles away from that spot? There are predictions we can make from the formula. So in the case of linear, where the rate of change is always constant, the equation is just pretty straightforward, and there's that definite connection between how much distance is accumulating and how fast is it accumulating. 
It's just the slope and the equation for the line. And the whole idea about a line is that rate is constant. No, no matter where we are on a line, no matter what two points we pick, the change in y over the change in x is always the same. Doesn't matter what two points we pick. And so typically with a line, we just pick any two points and, and compute the slope. And the accumulation is a pretty straightforward formula. If we know what the rate of change is and, and how much we had to start with, we can figure out the accumulation. So we've been working with this, that, that the rate of change or the slope of the line is something we can calculate. doesn't matter what two points we pick. So if, if we had, say, these two points, we can figure out our slope. the change in y divided by the change in x, 8 over minus 4, so a slope of minus 2. And if we actually kind of plot these points, let's see, 2 minus 3 is down here, and minus 2, 5 was up here. By looking at it, we should be able to figure out, oh, the slope is negative. And if we plotted it more and more precisely, figure out that it, it, it's negative and, and steeper than a slope of negative 1. So there's some comparison we can do about the slope just by looking at it, a rough idea of rise over run. So we get here the slope is negative 2. And that's fine. Doesn't matter what two points we pick on a line, we're always going to get the same slope. But if you recall, when we were doing all of our functions, we had a lot more functions than just the line. We had the absolute value function. Which is kind of one line and then suddenly changes to another line. And in fact, that sudden change is going to be a, a kind of key point to look at for the absolute value. Because we're, we're going along at one rate. For a while, and then suddenly the, there's a different rate on the other portion of the line. But all the other curves we looked at, the exponential, uh, quadratic, polynomials, none of those are lines. And yet if we're still going to be interested in what can we do with a rate of change, and if we can figure out a rate of change, is there also a way we can kind of reverse that if we know what the rate of change is and figure out, well, what was the original function? How, how is the accumulation working if somehow we've, we've stumbled on how it's changing? So we're going to be looking for other functions to kind of do the same comparison of how do the accumulation and rate of change relate to each other? So we're really looking to modify the idea to think about first rate of change. What we're going to focus for the next five or six weeks on the rate of change, the last three or four weeks on accumulation. But we're going to focus on the rate of change. So how do we modify our idea if we've got a curve? Because the rate of change isn't a constant on a curve. And in fact, we're going to be interested in, well, what's the rate of change at a specific point? Can no longer use the idea of just rise over run, because at a point, there's no change in y, there's no change in x. 
We, we can't do the same thing at any point. What we're going to be looking for is what's called the instantaneous rate of change. How exactly are we changing right at that point? So we're looking for the same idea, change in distance over change in time, change in output over change in input, but specifically at a single point. How would we go about figuring that out? Well, one method would be perhaps to zoom in really close. So I think this will pull up something we can graph here. So let's just start with a basic quadratic. Let me shift it a little bit. So maybe x minus 1 squared minus 3. So, so there's a basic quadratic. And what we're trying to figure out is, say, at a specific point on the quadratic. So maybe right at that point. How fast are we traveling right at that instant? You know, think somebody pulls out, or, you know, you're, you're traveling along on the road, and, and this is kind of describing you. A policeman pulls out a radar gun and, and captures your, your speed. Well, technically, when they pull out the radar gun, they're actually taking two measurements. Over a really short amount of time, how much distance did you travel? Uh, other places where you travel, maybe it said, you know, uh, speed is determined by air. You know, there, there are helicopters in the air watching the traffic. There, there are two lines on the pavement. They know the distance there, and they take a kind of stopwatch. How long did it get from this point to this point? And then they can convert your change in distance over. They know your change in distance over the little change in time. They can compute, well, how fast were you traveling? So we're going to still look at this idea of change in distance over change in time, but a really short interval of time. Well, one way to sort of emulate that here would be, let's zoom in on this curve. So it still kind of looks like a curve, but if I zoom in far enough, that pretty much looks like a straight line there. And if we could just use this point and some other point, with those two points, we could calculate the slope. So I could put in, say here, the line that goes through those two points. And notice that line is, well, it's, it's very, very close to the curve itself. Now when I zoom out, Set my scale somehow or other when I just be able to move it. Ah, let's restart. But but zooming in really close is one way, and just kind of look at two points that are are close, and, and that is one one way we're going to consider this is let's use this point and another point that's close and calculate the slope between those two lines. What we'll call that is a secant line and it's just going to be the change in y over the change in x. But we're also going to need to talk a little bit more about what do we really mean by close? How close is close? How do we know if we're close enough? So we need to talk more about that idea of close. So there are a couple ideas we're going to have to, to, to key in on, this idea of close, and look a little bit more about just what, a, what are the computations with the secant line look like. So as we zoom in closer and closer, it looks like a line. But even with zooming in, there's the question, you know, how do I know when I'm close enough? That it really is close enough to being a line. So there's another thing we could do, we could actually estimate a line called the tangent line. For, for the tangent line, the thing to think about would be think you're on a road traveling 
And, and at that particular point on the road, you hit a patch of ice. When you hit that ice, you're going to go in the direction you are going, which may not be staying on the road. And so we kind of have to look at this on eyeball. What is that direction we are going? That would be called the tangent line. Uh, I guess another way of thinking of it, maybe you're on a, say, a roller coaster in outer space, and your restraint system fails right there on the ride. You will continue going in the direction you were going, whatever that direction happens to be. Even though the ride itself changes direction, if, if you're no longer held in that ride, you will go in the direction you were going. And, and by eyeballing a, a curve, we, we can kind of roughly see what that tangent line is. So intuitively, either of these two ideas is, is okay for us. Practically, that doesn't help us get it accurate. But, but intuitively, we could think that we're zooming in really close and picking a couple points that are close. What's the line that connects those two points? Its slope should be close to the right slope. Or if I eyeball a line, what's the slope of that line? which still requires finding a couple points on that line to compute. So let's think about this a little bit. Here's, here's another graph. And the question is, for the graph at the right, at the point I've got put on there, would you say the tangent line is, that the slope of the tangent line is positive, negative, or zero? said, it's negative. If we eyeball it, the line's something like this. If different people might eyeball it slightly, but no, no matter how you eyeball it, that line has a negative slope. Actually, a, a reasonably steep negative slope, but it's a negative slope. We've just done our first calculus problem. From a graph, what is the slope of a tangent line? Now, we don't know exactly what it is. We, we could do a little bit more than eyeball it. We could draw it in and try to figure out the slope. Even then, we won't know exactly what it is. So long range, our goal is to figure out how do we find that slope exactly. The practical way to find the slope, not just the intuitive, oh, we can look at that and realize the slope is negative. Well, let's try another one. So same question, uh, same order of responses as well. At this point, what would you say about the slope of the tangent line? And over here, the slope is positive. We can eyeball it. Slope's positive. We can try to draw it in. We can pick a couple points and, and approximate a slope. But it certainly is a positive slope. One more for now. What about at this point? said the slope would be zero. And here's the case now. Come around here. Right at that instant, it looks like the slope of the tangent line is zero. It's a horizontal tangent line. And in fact, as we look at this, notice this graph is coming down, levels off, and goes back up. Intuitively, it almost looks like if the slope of the tangent line is negative, our function would be decreasing. 
if our tangent, slope of the tangent line is zero, and we were decreasing before and increasing after, well, it kind of looks like that. that's where our lowest point would be when we stop going down and start coming back up. And so it certainly appears there's a connection between the slope of the tangent line, being positive or negative, and the direction the curve is headed. And that is certainly true. And we're going to be trying to look to, to formalize that connection and how do we practically find it if we don't have the graph of the function in the first place. If all we have is the rule. How can we use the rule to answer some of these questions? About slope of the tangent line. What direction are we headed? Uh, where do we level off? And I'm going to ask another question here about this. So, say for, for this one. Would you say this slope, we already decided it was positive over here. Would you say it's about one, bigger than one, or less than one? Especially with it kind of up here and we can't even draw that tangent line. So let me see if I can kind of draw in a tangent line. Say I draw that line. Except for the little curve at the end. So it's going through what? 5, 0? That's one point. And I only extend it a little bit. Can't see it this well, but I'd say this is the point 6, 4. So we go over 1 and up 4, so our slope is actually uh, about 4. Now, assuming we eyeball it accurately, we are not going to be able to make 100% accurate computations here. But we should be able to make enough computation to get you know, to answer a question like this. Is the slope about 1? Is it bigger than 1 or less than 1? Really, for most lines, we should be able to tell is the slope kind of rise over run or equal. Rise is a lot bigger than the run. Rise is a lot less than the run. So, so for most lines, we can eyeball and at least make that determination. So here our slope, I would say, is bigger than 1. But there, there is a challenge in doing that. And it is a much harder question to answer from the graph. And at this point, we, we have no way to answer it other than from the graph. And so where we're actually kind of headed with, with this, and it's going to take us a few days to get there, is what are things we can do from the rule that would help us answer some of these questions? Where is the slope positive? Because we know the slope's positive somewhere. That tells us something about what the graph does. So if there's a way from the rule itself to figure out the slope, that then tells us something about the graph. So we've kind of gone here just from the graph to some information about the slope. Our goal is from the rule to be able to figure out some information about the slope and use that to tell us something about the graph. It is going to take us a little bit of time to get there. There are two things we need to discuss more before we get there. We certainly need a more systematic way to find the slope. Certainly if we're going to start with the rule, eyeballing the graph is off the table. We don't have the graph. That's kind of the point. If we just have the rule, we can't really eyeball the graph. Even if we have the graph, eyeballing it isn't isn't very accurate. We want to come up with a more accurate and systematic way to find the slope. Well, to do that, we're going to need to define a couple new things. The first thing we need to define is, is more of this idea 
of the secant line. The secant line is a line, it's, it's just two points on a curve. And we know how to find the slope of a line between two points. We've done that a number of times. But in terms of the secant line, so, so here, between A and B, what is drawn is a secant line. If I move B a little bit, you know, the slope of the secant line changes. And as I keep moving B, the slope of the secant line changes. Well, as I get B closer and closer and closer and closer to A, kind of intuitively looking at it, it looks like we're getting closer and closer to what we call the tangent line. So we've got the secant line which is a, a computation we're going to have to work with to figure out the slope. And we have this idea of getting closer and closer and closer. So both of the idea, those ideas we've got to talk about a little bit before we go into how can we get information about the slope of the tangent. And then it actually turns out there's a whole other way that it's actually easier to find information about the slope of the tangent but really isn't all that informative about what we're really finding. It's just sort of a magic rule, but it doesn't give us any sort of understanding of what's going on. So I'm taking a, what may seem a slightly more difficult path, or maybe more than slightly, a, a more difficult path. But my hope is it, it helps us understand what we're really finding. We're finding the slope of a tangent line, or, or an instantaneous rate of change. At an instant, how fast are we changing? So if we think about the idea of secant line, we're going to use two points on the curve. One of them we're going to keep in the same place. The, the point we're interested in calculating the slope at, we're going to keep in one place. We'll pick another point, figure out its line, and then this point we're going to move closer and closer and closer. What do we mean by closer? And that's really kind of the other idea we need to, to look at a little bit more in, in general. The idea of what, what happens when we move a point closer and closer and closer. So our informal definition of the tangent line is it's a line in a curve that does its best to be the curve at that point. It's also the line we get as we move our second point here closer and closer and closer to the fixed point. So back to this. As I move point B closer and closer and closer, I'm getting closer and closer and closer to the tangent line. I don't think I can put this right at zero. And even if I can get it to stop at zero, right at zero, I'm not sure it's going to graph anything for us. But I'm moving the point B closer and closer. Graph B as well and move it. Move the whole thing. So that's the idea we want to pursue. This moving one point closer and closer and closer to a fixed point. Well, there, there are two ideas going on here. The idea of getting closer and closer and closer, which in calculus we mean a limit, and this computation. Ultimately, we want to pair the two together. But for today, we're going to back up just a little bit, and we're just going to look at the idea of what happens to, to a, a simpler function as we get closer and closer and closer to a point. So when we say uh, limit, we're just making, it's, it's the mathematical terminology for, for what is happening as we get closer and closer and closer to a point. So the limit of f of x as x approaches c is l. This is the statement we'll write. And this is how we'll read it. The limit of f of x as x approaches c is equal to l. And what it means is as x gets closer and closer to c, the output values are getting closer and closer to some 
result that we can predict. So we've got a curve, we want to get close to a, a certain value of the input, and we're trying to predict you know, where do we think we're going to end up at following the function. As we do that, we don't really care what the value of the function is. We just care trends in the output value as the input values are getting closer and closer and closer to C. And you know, the function may not even be defined right at C. It may be something totally outrageous at C. Or it may be exactly what we expect. For the idea of the limit, we don't care. There's another topic where, yes, we do care. But for the idea of the limit, we don't care whether the function is defined right at C. It's something totally unexpected, or it is in fact exactly what we thought we were headed for. So, so let's look at some examples. So we're looking at the graph. And, and here, we're, we're leaving the idea of the tangent line for a little bit. That's what's motivating this concept of limit. But, but for now, we're just going to look at the graph of the function and try to address some questions. The limit as x approaches 1. So as our inputs get closer and closer to 1, we're trying to figure out, is, is there some output that we're getting close to? And so as we look at this graph, would you say there's some output we're getting close to? everybody said two. And that is correct. As we get really close to one with the input, the output is getting to be two. And in fact, in this particular case, right at one, the output is two. But again, we don't really care what's happening right at one. If something unexpected happens right at one, that still doesn't affect what the limit is. Let's look at a different place. So let's look now. The limit as x approaches 2. Where the limit as x approaches 2. We're looking at inputs really, really, really close to 2. So we're up here on the curve. We're up here on the curve. All the outputs are really close to 2. The fact that something weird happens right at 2 and we don't actually go to where we're intending is something we are interested in and something we will look at a little bit later in the lecture. But in terms of the limit, we don't care what happens right at 2. We care what happens as we get really, really close. And kind of think of you're walking on along a path. And you see ahead of you, you have in mind where you're headed. That's your destination. Little do you know that someone set a trap there. And when you actually get there, you're going to fall in a pit. You're not going to end up where you think you're going. The limit is where you think you're going. Whether you actually get there is a different question. But for the limit, based on the graph, where does it look like we're headed? Where does it look like the function's headed? That's the idea of the limit. Um, messed up my 
my slide somewhere over here. So, so, so same graph, what would you say in this case? What's the limit as x approaches 3? So same function, and I think we've already identified kind of the two heights here. But what would you say in this case? If you're wandering along the path, what heights do you think you're headed to? So here we're walking along the path, getting closer to 4, closer to the input of 4. The outputs are, in fact, in both cases, getting close to 1. Again, the fact that something different and unusual happens at 1 is a different question. But as far as the limit goes, when x is really close to 4, we're really close to 1 in the output. Here, I guess, we're thinking sort of a booby-trapped path we're walking along. Here, we step on a, a, one of those traps that, that pulls you up in the air. And so you end up someplace different than you thought you were going. You thought you were going to a certain height, then, whoa, I, I, I'm not at that height. We, we are definitely interested in when that happens, but it's not a question of does the limit exist or what the limit's value is. Ending up someplace unexpected is different than the limit. The limit is, where do we think we're headed? And back to in 3, the reason the limit in 3 doesn't exist is, we don't know exactly where we're headed, because it depends on which, which side of the path we're on. From one side we're headed one way, from the other side we're headed someplace different. We don't know exactly where we're headed. And so, in that case, we say it doesn't exist. Now, since we have some of those situations, we do have a special notation for that. The limit as x approaches c, either from the right. So instead of looking at the path both ways, we are only going to come from the right. So in terms of what we did here, the limit as x approaches 3 from the right side of 3 is 2. Because if we're on this side of the path, it does look like we're headed to a height of 2 as opposed to coming from the left. And if these two are not the same, well, then the limit doesn't exist. And again, we don't really care if we actually get to that point, if we actually get to that output or not. We're just trying to decide where do we think we're headed? 
as we get closer and closer and closer, where do we think we're headed? In this case, we are only, you know, tunnel vision, we're only looking at the right. We don't care what's happening to the left. Or if we have the limited X approach to C from the left. Tunnel vision, but now we're only looking, coming from the left. We don't care what's happening to the right. We don't care what's happening right at C. We're just getting closer and closer and closer from the left. So let's look at a couple more examples just to kind of illustrate that. So here, we've got the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right. What would you say the, the limit as x approaches negative 2 from the right is for this particular graph? Three from the right, we're on this portion of the curve, getting closer and closer to three. The outputs look like they're closer to one. The fact that something different is happening on the left does not matter for the one sided limit. If it was the limit as x approaches three, in fact, all the ones we've looked at, <coughs> the limit would be undefined or does not exist. If we get two different values. But for functions, especially if they're defined in two pieces, we'll look at one-sided limits. Let's come from one direction as opposed to coming from the other direction. So this one, what would you say here the limit as x approaches to from the left is? Two from the left. I only care about points on this side of two. So I only care about the points up here. Walking along the path up here, I am headed to a height of two. The fact that at two something different happens is immaterial. I don't really care what's happening on the other side of two for this question. This was the limit as x approaches two from the left. Got 
this way. Luminous X approaches 3 from the right. So here x is approaching 3 from the right. So we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer to 3 from the right only. We don't care what's happening on the other side. So up on this portion of the curve, is there a trend in the output? Yes, the outputs are all trending to a height of 2. The closer we get, the closer to 2 it seems we're getting. We're trending to 2. The fact that something different happens to the left isn't of concern in this particular question. If it was just the limit as x approaches 3, we would be concerned about both directions. So we could be asked with the limit only come from the right, only come from the left, or just approach 3, in which case we've got to think either side we could come to. I think I'll skip that one because we've kind of done that. Now, we can do this with a table as well. So, let's consider this example. Limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. A couple different tables I want to work with here. Uh, since we're in business calculus, but let's pull up Excel and see if we can use the spreadsheet to, to get us some tables. So I'm going to make a table of x and f of x. So give me some number you think is close to 1. 2. All right, we'll start with 2. Our function is our input squared. Minus 1, all divided by our input, minus 1. Now, the reason I put the formula in this way is I want to change what the input is. So I don't want to build 2 into the formula. I want to point back to the input because I'm going to reuse this formula. So there the answer is 3. Now, we said 2 is close to 1. Can we get closer? 1.1. Okay, 1.1. This will calculate the function at 1.1. Can we get closer? 1.001. Did you say 3 of Yeah. And it will compute the function there. Now, with the table, with the question, well, we could keep doing this. We could keep adding in zeros. How close is close enough? Well, there, there are two kind of things. One, we, we need to be close enough that, that we're pretty sure we can identify a pattern. Any, anybody identify a pattern here? Where does it look like the outputs are headed? I, I'd say it's, they're headed to two, right? They're, I mean... We might do one more. Let's throw in, say, another zero. Looks like it's headed to two. Now, we've been getting closer and closer and closer to one. All of these, though, we've been on the right side. We better look on the other side as well. Something, something, something weird may be happening on the other side. The only way to know is look. So let's go to the other side. What's something close to 1? All right, well, we'll start with 0. So 
So we had one, we, we started with zero. Can we get closer? Closer to one, only now from the left. Hmm? I heard a point something. Point three? All right, that, that is closer. How about point nine? What would be closer? Point nine nine. Point nine nine nine. From the left, where does it look like we're headed? Two, same value as we got from the right. So it certainly looks like, in this case, we are getting closer and closer and closer to two. Notice what happens with this if I actually plug in x equals one. It gives me an error. It will not do the computation right at one, because we have division by zero. Numerator is also zero, but, but division by zero so we can't figure out what happens right at one. We can only figure out what happens really near one and try to determine is there a pattern. We can do that with Excel. Excuse me. We can do it with a graphing calculator. Let me pull up a graphing calculator. x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. There is a table function. Depending on how the calculator is set up, the table function might be set up to automatically, like, let's just fill in some values, and, and this is 0, 1, 2, etc. Well, for what we want to do, that's not very helpful, because we want to get closer and closer and closer to 1. We, we, we don't want these values. But there is under the table set option here, the option to, instead of independently, giving you the independent variable automatically, have it ask. And so then we go to the table and notice there's nothing there because it's waiting for us to tell it what value of x we want to look at. So we pick things like 1.1, 1.1, 1.01, now let's go, 001, notice it's giving us the same values we had here. If we jump to the other side, 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 9, I mean it's doing the same computations we just did with Excel, so it's just a different way of doing the computations. If we graph this, In this particular ma method, we don't really notice anything happening. And we can even, on here, the graph, go to trace and say, let's just pick some values of x that are close. So, there's the trace. 0.9, we could go to 0.99 and get a sense of where this is headed. We could also, let's see, if we do a zoom decimal. Notice graphing zoom decimal, it does something a little weird. Right at one, it realizes, oh, right at one, this function is not defined. The reason we didn't have that in the previous graph, the previous graph was plotting it at weird values of x. It didn't pick x equals one exactly to try. Here with the decimal, it is specifically plotting very nice points, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 1, where it realizes, wait a minute, the function's not defined at 1, so it doesn't put any points, and then picks it up again. So we can work with the table to get an idea of where do we think the function is trending. I've got a worksheet as well where you can kind of put in different values of x closer and closer to 1, 
to see what the, the value of y is. The, the disadvantage a table has is how, how do we know we're close enough? Could something really weird be going on there and, and we're, we're just not seeing the full picture? But at least we're going to use a, a calculator or Excel as one way to approach the problem. So as we did this, we started with two and we kind of already did this already. We got closer, we got closer, we figured out a pattern. It looks like the outputs are headed to two. That would be our limit in this case. So we can do limits from a graph. We can do limits from the rule if we pull out our calculator. We don't care what happens right at one. The whole idea of the limit is just when the inputs are really, really, really close to one, is there a trend in the outputs? We decided, yes, there is. We're getting close to two. On this particular one, is there some algebra we could do first? Is there anything we can do with that that maybe, maybe that whole expression would simplify? Yeah, the, the, the numerator does factor. It's x plus 1, x minus 1. Oh, and there's a common factor of x minus 1. Technically, we have just changed things a little bit. This function is not defined right at 1. This one is. But for the limit, we don't care what's happening right at 1 anyway. So the fact that we did something different right at 1, that technicality, we're, we're not going to let bother us at this point. If we look at this, even intuitively, if we take a number that's really close to 1 and add 1 to it, what would we get? Would we get something that's really close to 2? 1 plus a number that's really close to 1? Well, that ought to be really close to 2. So in this form, we can more intuitively not have to pull out a table, but just kind of by inspection, realize, well, if x is really close to 1, and I add 1 to that, I'm going to be really close to 2. So if we can do some algebra to get it in a form like this, it simplifies nicely. We don't have to pull out a table. We can argue more, just that the limit's a little bit more obvious if it's in a form like that. Unfortunately, the question we're most interested in about slopes of secant lines the form is going to be more like that, where we would have to do some algebra first before we could just kind of look and see, see what the limit is. But if there is some algebra that we could do and simplify things a little bit, usually that does really help us in determining the, the limit. So we, we will not do a lot with needing to do some algebraic simplifications, but we are going to see it a little bit. There's a, just some times we've got to simplify a little bit. And in Calc 1, we, we do a lot more of this, and, and it's often the algebra, not the calculus concept that, that gives students trouble. How do we simplify an expression like this to something we can work with? Now, there, there's one other topic we need to, to touch on briefly that, that we've kind of been skirting around that this whole time as we look at limits. For the limit, we didn't care if we actually got to the point in question. We were just trying to decide where are we headed. Whether we got there or not was immaterial. For continuity, it is the, the key point. Do we really get to where we, we're headed? A function is continuous at, let me try to make sure I do the same definition they give at x equals a if the limit as x approaches a of f of x is actually equal to f of a. Or more intuitively, we actually arrive at the point we were headed to. 
or at the value we were headed to. The value we were headed to is the limit. The value of the function there is, is where we arrive. Do we actually get to where we were, we were headed? So back at this one. At this point, the function is continuous. We were headed to 1, or headed, I guess, to 2 in this case, and we actually got there. That, that is the value there. Nothing unusual is happening at 1. However, at 2, something unusual was happening. At 2, this function is not continuous. We were headed someplace, but that's not the actual value of the function there. That was the one we fell in the pit. We didn't get to where we thought we were going. So on the curve, if you ever don't get to where you think you're going, the function not continuous. It's also here not continuous at x equals 4. For the same reason. We were headed to look like the 1, but for whatever reason, the actual value of the function there was 3. This function is also not continuous at x equals 3. Because in fact, at x equals 3, we're not even headed somewhere. If the limit doesn't exist, there, there's no way it's going to equal the value of the function. If we can't even figure out where we're headed, well, then there's no way we get to where we're headed. So intuitively, continuity is if we arrive at where we're headed. If we can't tell where we're headed because of a situation like this, well, you certainly can't right arrive there. What was it, Yogi Berra, that said something, if you don't know where you're going, you're probably not going to get there. Something, something like that. Uh, or, you know, his claim he said something like that. So if, if, if the limit doesn't exist, well, there, there's no way it can equal the value of the function. There are a couple other ways the limit could fail to exist besides what we see here. Um, we're, we're not going to see those often. Uh, when, when we had a vertical asymptote, in this case, say the limit as x approaches 2 of this function coming from the left, does not exist. There's not a specific value we're headed to. There are instances where we say, well, we're headed to plus infinity because there's a trend. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but there's not a specific value that we would say, oh, this is where we're headed. That one we could see a little bit because it does come into play with rational functions. Whenever we divide by zero, we could be headed off to infinity. One that I don't think we're going to see much at all in business calculus, say, is a function that, that is kind of oscillating, and the closer we get, the more it oscillates. There, there's just no value, no one value that we're approaching. That kind of requires a trig function, and, and we specifically don't really deal with trig functions in business calculus. But what we've got to watch for is you know, any kind of jump in the function. It's not going to be discontinuous there. Um, if we're headed off to infinity, that's a problem. Uh, if we've got a bunch of oscillations, that's a problem. So our limit actually has to exist. The function has to be defined. And they have to match up. This one, there was a hole at 1. We could have filled in that hole. But as it was given, the function's not defined at 1. 
it's discontinuous as well, as well, even though the limit exists. The function at 1 is not defined. So that's what happened in this one. Right at 1, the limit exists fine, but the function is not defined there. So our main purpose is going to be, you know, can, can we spot when a function is discontinuous? Because if it's discontinuous, all the analysis things we, we hope to do, we're not going to be able to do. So we just need to kind of realize, wait a minute, that function's not acting predictably enough to make any predictions. I mean, we at least have to identify that particular function has a problem. So you know, this function has a problem in a few places. We can't predict what's happening here because we can see something unusual happening. Can't predict what's happening there or there. In every other place, you know, we can make predictions because it's a a continuous function. So, fortunately, most of the functions we're going to work with are, and most of them are such we can actually do what we did here for the limit. Just kind of think it out. If x is close to one, where does it look like we're headed? Uh, you know, piecewise function. If the rule changes, well, we'll see those occasionally. We use one rule for a while and then a different rule. So if we suddenly change the rule, there might be a jump. And certainly division by zero is, is a potential problem. Check this. I think I'm nearly to the end. Assignment here is actually fairly short, one through nine the odds, but uh, three seems to be missing. So it'd be one, five, seven, and nine. And on nine, it asks about three conditions of continuity. Don't worry about that part of the question. It just asks um, something about where is the function continuous, or where is the function not continuous. Uh, yeah, where is the fi find at least one point where it's not continuous. Don't worry about which of the three conditions is violated. Just where, where is the function not continuous? So, I will see you on Tuesday.